So this is the second part of section 3-4. This is on, let me go back here and find it. So far back here, there it is, section 3-4, multiplication of whole numbers. So this is going to be the second part of that. Multiplication and other bases. So we just covered lattice multiplication. That's going to be really helpful for us in other bases because it's going to keep us from having to do all the regrouping. It's going to keep everything nice and small for us. So I went ahead and did the one for base 5. So the one for base 5, if you look closely at it, let's go through where all these numbers came from because this looks like a hot dumpster fire, right? Because you're like 4 times 2 is 13. No. Remember this is base 5. So writing down the lattice to start with, and these are my diagonals. I know they're not showing up too well here. All right, four times two is eight, but this is base five. So eight is one group of five with three left over. So this is not 13, this is one, three, base five. 4 times 1 is 4. 3 times 2 is 6, which is one group of 5 and one left over. 3 times 1 is 3. So you have to remember to multiply in base 5, and now you got to remember to add in base 5. When you add along those diagonals, you have to add in base 5 as well. So that's 4. That's 3 plus 3, which is 6. Don't put 6 there. There is no 6 in base 5. 6 is one group of 5 carried into the next place value and one left over. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. And then that 1 right there. Um, when you're finished, make sure you only have base 5 digits. Remember, there's only 5 base 5 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If you accidentally end up with a 6, that's a very good indication that you did something wrong. All right, so I'm going to draw the lattice for you for this base 9 problem and then see if you can do that one without me. So we have 8, 7, 1 times 25. Diagonals in there. Trying to darken those just so you can tell where my diagonals are going to be that you add along. All right, all this is in base 9. So when we multiply, we got to remember that everything's in base 9. So 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 5 is 5. 7 times 2 is 14. Don't write 1, 4. That's a base 10 number. 14... So 7 times 2 is 14. That is one group of 9 and 5 left over. So 7 times 2 is 14, is one group of 9 and 5 ones. That's a base 10 number. So I have to convert it to a base 9 number. 7 times 5 is 35. 7 times 5 is 35. How many 9s are in 35? So how many 9s are in 35? So split that up into groups of 9 and then the leftovers. So 
So it looks like three groups of nine. That would be 27, right? And then what, like eight left over? And give me a second to kind of process all of this. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 is one group of 9 with 7 left over. 8 times 5 is 40. 40 is four groups of nine, four times nine is 36, with four left over. So that's four groups of nine and four ones. Then we just have to add along the diagonals in base nine. So you still got to be thinking about base 9. 8, 9, 10. That's one group of 9 with one left over. Let's see, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 is 9 and 4 left over. So that's 11, 12, 13 is 9 and four left over and then that's one plus one which is two so my final answer here is two four four one five base nine i think i always can tell if those those are fours so two four four one five base nine base nine is tricky because it's so close to ten that the these answers look like they're close but wrong like you're like seven times two is 14 why'd she put 15 is is she on drugs or something no nope not at all it's all about the base nine all right again if you want to see some more examples of these just drop me an email i can do some more examples um you know, but i didn't know if this would be enough to try to get you know at least get the ball rolling and get you trying to figure out how these how these work um, mental multiplication techniques now remember this means you're defining the exact answer by using doing it in your head so front end multiplication that one is taking something like 36 and splitting it up this is a distributed process this is basically using the distributive property and taking 8 times 30 and then 8 times 6. So 8 times 30, 8 times 6. So you get 240 and 48. That's actually how my brain works with this. If I have to multiply something like that, I'll do 8 times 30 and then 8 times 6 and add them together. Same thing here. I'll do 3 times 50 and 3 times 2. You can do something called compensation. So like 12 times 9, you can do 12 times 10 and then subtract 1. But you're not subtracting 1. You're subtracting one group of 12. And this, one, this one doesn't really work for my brain all that well. I don't usually think to, I don't usually think to do subtraction. You know, with these, I prefer to do addition. However, you know, with this one, I would do 9 times 10 and 9 times 2 and do 90 and um, 18 and get 108. But something like this, yeah, I probably would do the compensation. Just because 98 is kind of messy. And so 100 minus 2 and doing that 45 times 100 and then 45 times 2 does make this a lot nicer to do mentally. Although I'm sure you guys look at that and you're like, I'm not doing that in my head. And I got to tell you, first glance, I might not want to do that in my head either. So, so we have this, this front end multiplication. And all these kind of use, utilize the distributive property. 
So just kind of notice that. We have compensation, which means that we change these numbers and then we compensate for it. So we change 9 to something nicer, which is 10, but then we have to compensate for changing it. We have compatible numbers. Okay. Now these I didn't do because I wanted to see if you guys could find some compatible numbers. Now again, what's compatible for some people may not be compatible for others. So what's compatible for some person may not be compatible for somebody else. But I think most of these will probably be able to agree on. So pause the video and see what you can do with multiplying these in your head and how you would group these. All right. So I doubt very seriously that you would multiply this in your head. Right. I would group the five and the two together. And get ten. That way this is 346 times 10 and it's pretty easy to multiply by 10, right? Because all you got to do is add a zero. So you get 3460 out of it. Um, this one, I would group the 25 and the 4 together and get 100. And then the 9 times 11 and get 99. So those are compatible numbers. Not so much the 9 and 11, but the 25 and the 4. Those are definitely the compatible ones. All right, what about this? Well, 20 times 5 is nice, right? That one's just 100. 2 times 5 is nice. That's just 10. So I'd have 10, 100, and 9. Well, that's just a 9 with three zeros. So it's just 9,000. So all these techniques are geared toward multiplying bigger numbers. Um, one thing that I felt was missing from this, um, from this textbook was what about techniques for learning your basic multiplication facts? You know, it's, it's all geared toward these bigger numbers here. But when it comes to your basic multiplication facts, everything that we're doing here assumes that the kids know their basic multiplication facts. And I'm here to tell you that that is going to be a challenge in and of itself because they're going to struggle with it. Um, it's not so much about just rote memorization. That will happen eventually. But it's worth noting that there's a certain core here. And this is, again, this is not necessarily um, how everybody believes. Some people, some teachers believe that you just have to memorize them and go on with your life. Um, having two children, one of which is good at memorizing and the other one is not <laughs> kind of opened my eyes to, to this kind of idea. My first child memorized everything and that's it. It was no problem. My second one, he's in uh, third grade. We just finished third grade and he is not so good at memorizing. So for him, it was, it was important for me to establish a core group and really, you know, build upon those. So he knew how to multiply by two because it was just a double. Multiplying by three was a double and then one group or a triple because he could skip count, right? Fives were pretty easy because again, skip counting. Tens were easy because you had a zero. The nines were easy for him because we did either the finger trick or a uh, digit pattern. I don't know if you guys know what the finger trick is, but let's see if I can get all my hands in here. Um, nine times four. So watch one, two, three, four. Nine times four is 36. Six. So nine times three. One, two, three. Put that one down is two, seven, 27. Nine times five. One, two, three, four, five. That's 45. Nine times seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is five. That's 63. So sorry, you have to look at my, my hands for all that. Um, the digit pattern, if you have um, nine times one is nine, nine times two is 18, nine times three is 27. 
1 times 4 is 36. 1 times 5 is 45. 1 times 6 is 54. 1 times 7 is 63. So something to note about these digits, the digits always add up to 9. 4 plus 5, 2 plus 7, 1 plus 8, 7 plus 2. So my, my um, third grader knew, knows that 9 times 6 is going to be 5, because it's one less than that digit, and then the other digit is going to help him add up to 9. So that's what worked best with his brain. So whether you look for that digit pattern or you use a finger trick, the nines, you know, he, he got. Now, once we had that core, now we built off of that. That fours were just double the twos. Sixes were double the threes. Sevens were a combination of five and two. You know, so like eight times seven, well, that was eight times five plus eight times two. And while that may sound complicated, that is what worked best for him. The eights were the fives and the threes. The elevens were 10 and one, 12 is 10 and two. So if he had to do nine times 12, he would do, oh, hey, look at that. He would do nine times 10 and nine times two and add those together. So while I realize that this may seem, you know, a lot more complex, when you have different learning styles, you have to be able to meet the kids where, where they are. You got to meet them where they're at and you got to have something to help those because if they don't know their basic multiplication facts in third grade, and let's say that you're teaching fourth grade, forget it. They are not going anywhere beyond third grade without knowing these basic multiplication facts. And there's even so much, there's only so much that they can even do with just having a multiplication grid to help them. If they have to constantly reference it, then it's still going to be really, really challenging for them. All right. Last up, the estimating. This one, pretty much the only useful one is just um, rounding. So I'm just not even going to bother with that because it's just your typical um, rounding. So, all right, that concludes section three, four.